aspect of the armor of God, <clears throat> which is spirit-filled prayer, because in Ephesians chapter 6, after the Apostle Paul um, <clears throat> names and explains the different pieces of armor uh, <clears throat> given to a Christian, um, the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel shoes of peace, the shield of faith, uh, <clears throat> the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, then he goes on and says, praying always, this is starting at verse 18 of Ephesians 6, praying all, always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching therein too, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> so, uh, Ephesians is such a remarkable book because so much of the book, most of the book, is about the amazing position that we hold as Christians, as, the, as a child of God. Uh, Ephesians tells us that God chose us for himself before the foundation of the world, before he ever said, let there be light. And before he created this world, he had already decided you belong to him if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. <clears throat> and, uh, and the book of Ephesians tells us about the high and exalted place that we've been given. So much so, I mean, it's mind-blowing because it even tells us that one day we will sit with God on his throne. I mean, something that's just unfathomable to me when you consider <laughs> that we're still <clears throat> weak, human, sinful people. <clears throat> And yet we have been exalted above the stars of God. <clears throat> but he ends this book with this incredible dire warning <clears throat> of saying, even though you've been granted all these things as a believer, that doesn't mean it's a cakewalk. That doesn't mean that we simply walk through this life without problems because we have an incredible enemy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Satan hates God. And because God loves us, Satan hates us. He hates the people of God. <clears throat> and it's something that, that, that I've actually spent time thinking about. Why does he hate us so much? And what I came to realize, and probably someday I'll teach a lesson or six or ten, <clears throat> on the subject of why the devil hates us so much. And, and here's, here's what I found. Because everything that Satan said he was going to do in Isaiah 14, <clears throat> he's going to be, de be denied all those things. I Isaiah 14, where he says, <clears throat> I will be like the Most High. Mm -hmm. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the congregation of the, of the um, um, mount, uh, in the mount of the congregation in the north. All the things that he said he was going to do, the seven <clears throat> I wills of, uh, of Satan, they're all going to be denied to him and all of them are given to us Amen. who never sought it. <clears throat> and so he hates us so very much. <clears throat> he is our adversary, <clears throat> uh, the devil. And the Bible warns us about his wiles. Uh, the word is methodea, <clears throat> which means cunning arts and deceitfulness and craftiness and diabolical schemes. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the things that Satan has... Uh, structure to do in order to ruin our lives that is his desire and we're warned in james chapter 1 verse 14 that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed and the picture there uh, that uh, that the bible uses uh, to be drawn away means to be drawn out using a lure and the word enticed uh delies who means to catch using bait and so it draws this picture of Satan as being a master fisherman or a master hunter who sets his traps, who baits his hooks, uh, waiting for the, the uh, ignorant Christian, the ignorant believer who doesn't understand his wiles mm -hmm. <clears throat> to be caught in that trap. <clears throat> but the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices because we have the word of God. Mm -hmm. So if we study the word of God and learn the word of God and have taught and preached to us the word of God, then we don't have to be ignorant of his devices. <clears throat> so we have <clears throat> considered the various pieces of armor there in Ephesians chapter 6. 
<clears throat> but it goes on with perhaps the, the greatest provision that God has made for us, and that is the provision of prayer. The provision of prayer. <clears throat> um, and specifically, spirit-filled prayer. <clears throat> so that's what we started looking at last week <clears throat> with three different uh, truths that I want to share uh, over the next couple of weeks on this issue of spirit-filled prayer. The concept of spirit-filled prayer, the context of spirit-filled prayer, and the content of spirit-filled prayer. So last week we started with the concept of spirit-filled prayer, <clears throat> talking about just what is it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> prayer simply is defined as a request for help or an expression of thanks directed to God. <clears throat> and in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, where it says, praying always with all prayer, uh, <clears throat> the word in both places is pros UK, which simply is a general word for prayer. It's talking about praying with all prayer, which maybe sounds confusing. What praying with all prayer? <clears throat> maybe it'd be more clear if it, if you understood it as praying with all kinds of prayer, <clears throat> uh, because it's talking about that word simply means general requests made to God. So it's simply talking to God. And Martin Luther said, "To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing," which is a, a, a good understanding of what prayer means <clears throat> because it is the breath of a redeemed soul <clears throat> expressing its needs and its thanks and its thoughts <clears throat> and its desires and its worship towards God. <clears throat> so whenever we turn our attention to God, whenever we speak to him, that is praying. And it can take all kinds of different forms. And <clears throat> that's what it's talking about, praying with all prayer, all kinds of prayer. We pray in private. Oftentimes we uh, pray in public. We pray out loud. Oftentimes we pray silently. Sometimes we whisper our prayers. <clears throat> uh, much of our prayer is spontaneous, but yet we still have times that we set aside for prayer. When we pray uh, together at a meal, when we pray um, <clears throat> together as a couple or as a family, <clears throat> we pray in all kinds of positions or postures. Uh, we pray when we're sitting down, we can pray when we're standing, we can pray when we're kneeling, we can pray when we're lying down. Those are usually, at least for me, very short prayers. Dear Lord, thank you for this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we can pray when, we're, when we walk, we can pray when we drive, <clears throat> we can pray when we're uh, on vacation, uh, walking down the beach, walking through Disney World, walking wherever you might be on vacation, mm -hmm. in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we can still pray. We can pray with our, our uh, hands up. We can pray with our hands down. <clears throat> the Bible does, in fact, talk about praying with, with raised hands. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without mm -hmm. wrath and doubting. So as long as those hands are holy, mm -hmm. if you want to raise them when you pray, <clears throat> that's biblical. We can pray with our eyes closed. We can pray with our eyes open, especially if we happen to be driving while we're praying. And most definitely, you want to pray with your eyes open. <clears throat> uh, uh, and, uh, and Jesus did it <clears throat> when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, in John 11, I believe it was, <clears throat> uh, the Bible tells us that he lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. <clears throat> that's not eyes closed. That's eyes open looking into heaven. <clears throat> so the Bible talks about all these different kinds of prayer, uh, uh, places of prayer, forms of prayer, postures of prayer, circumstances of prayer. And yet what's interesting is that the Bible doesn't exalt any of them over the others. <clears throat> it gives all these different examples, but it doesn't say, and this way is best. <clears throat> I mean, I know there's people that think you can't pray unless you're kneeling down. Uh, that doesn't include people... 60 and over, right? Because we know how hard it is to get down on our knees and how much harder it is to get up. Uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> you can pray in all kinds of different ways. <clears throat> Jesus pr prayed probably more than any man on earth when he was here. The Bible gives several examples of him praying all night long. And you might think, wait a second, he was the son of God. He was God the son. Why did he need to pray? Why did he even need to pray? He, didn't he know everything? 
<clears throat> well, the Bible tells us that he emptied himself when he came into this world. He emptied himself, not of his divine holiness, not of his divine power, <clears throat> but of some of his divine knowledge so that he would be dependent on his father because he is our example. Right. <clears throat> we are to follow him. Mm -hmm. And he prayed all the time. <clears throat> the Bible tells us he prayed standing. He prayed sitting down. He prayed kneeling. Maybe other positions as well. We don't know. But <clears throat> he prayed all the time, which is telling us that we can pray anywhere. We can pray at any time. We can pray about anything and in any posture. <clears throat> That's why the Bible talks about praying always with all prayer. <clears throat> always simply carries the idea of prayer being appropriate at all times and in all seasons at, at every opportunity and <clears throat> whatever it is that we're dealing with. <clears throat> I looked today at some stuff online. Uh, I guess it's uh, Hindus have to pray twice a day. Uh, Jews have, uh, Orthodox Jews at least, have a set number of times. And I'm not sure what it is, but when I was locked up, I had some Jewish friends, and they always prayed three times a day. Uh, Muslims have five times a day that they're supposed to pray. <clears throat> and you might think, well, what about Christians? We kind of missed out on that because we don't have a, a s X number of times a day mm -hmm. that we're supposed to pray. Well, that's actually not true. Because <clears throat> we've already been talking about our time to pray is always, Constantly. always, yep. always. <clears throat> praying always with all prayer. And the Bible talks about that in a number of different places. Uh, for example, Romans 12, 12 says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That means always, always <clears throat> ready to pray. Uh, Colossians 4, 2 says, continue in prayer. That's a prayer on a continuous basis and watching in the same with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. <coughs> so there's, there's no time in which we don't need to pray. Uh, <clears throat> there's no time when we can't pray. There's no time when God is unwilling to listen to us, <clears throat> or to hear our prayers. Now you might think, well, what about when we're backslidden? God doesn't listen to us when we're backslidden. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what the Bible says. <clears throat> uh, we may not be saying what he wants us to say, what we need to say, which is, I'm sorry, I repent. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that he doesn't hear us and that he's not still at work in our life to bring us back to a right walk with him. <clears throat> so there's no time that God is not listening to us that we can't pray. Now, to pray always... All right. It, it doesn't mean that we walk around all the time in an attitude of formal prayer. <clears throat> we don't walk around with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, uh, <clears throat> uh, with our with our you know hands together or whatever. <clears throat> we don't do that. Jesus didn't do that, and yet he was, I'm sure, in communication with his Father all the time. The disciples didn't do that, <clears throat> so it doesn't mean praying always does not mean that you always are in an attitude of formalistic prayer. <clears throat> and praying always doesn't mean that we're following some sort of ritualistic prayers that are recited manually from books. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that we can't learn anything about prayer or, or good prayers from books. <clears throat> um, probably about a year ago, uh, my buddy who many of you know, Steve Davis, <clears throat> told me about this book that he had gotten, and I found it online and got a copy of it, and you can actually find it, uh, find the book itself online, where you can read it online. <clears throat> it's called In the Valley of Vision, and what it is, it's a collection of prayers from the Puritans from the 1600s. Uh, <clears throat> and it, they had a great love of God and humility, and <clears throat> I still... Uh, uh, will read their prayers uh, from time to time uh, just because they had this great depth of humility and submission to God and it's encouraging and helpful and I find myself praying the prayers uh, that, now <clears throat> that's perfectly okay uh, if, if you want if you want to see the book for yourself there's a website called books books b o o k s v o o k s dot com I don't know what that title means, but that's the, that's the name of the website. And you can find there uh, 
uh, The Valley of Vision, and you can read the book online free. Obviously, there's no copyright left on it. It's from the 1600s. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so you can learn about prayers by reading prayers and by hearing other people pray. And that's how most of us uh, learned. You know, even if you were saved as a, as a young child, you learned to pray because your uh, parents taught you and your, your preacher taught you and your Sunday school uh, teacher taught you. So we learn about prayer oftentimes by reading other prayers, hearing other people pray. <clears throat> but praying always doesn't simply mean reading some formalistic prayer out of a book that has no meaning to you. And praying always certainly does not mean that we, we count beads or, or simply repeat memorized prayers <clears throat> or prayer phrases. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible tells us that's what the pagans do. In fact, Jesus specifically warned against it. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, he said to his disciples, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. That's empty repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. <clears throat> and uh, uh, <clears throat> that's simply saying the same empty prayer over and over and over and over again and without it holding any meaning, any reality mm -hmm. to you. <clears throat> because they think that they're going to be heard by how many times they say the prayer. <clears throat> and that's simply not true. That's simply not true. <clears throat> uh, there is no power in saying, you know, 10 Hail Marys and to our fathers and then 10 Hail Marys and to our fathers or whatever, whatever the rosary is. <clears throat> um, now, it's been a very, very, I was raised Catholic, all right? <clears throat> But it's been obviously a lot of years. I, I got saved when I was 19, and I'm 62, so it's been a while. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but I remember um, I'd only been saved a, a couple of years. I was in a record store going through a bunch of records, and I came across a record of the rosary. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it, it was a record of somebody praying the rosary. So I'm thinking, okay, so the Catholic buys this, takes it home. You know, it's, it's Saturday morning. Catholic gets up, says, uh, God, I need to go wash the car, but I'm going to play this record. So please listen to this and make sure you put those points on my account. All right, Ooh. later. <laughs> um, I mean, like, like the Lord would actually be impressed with that. He specifically said that's vain repetitions, and he called the people who do that heathen, heathen. Who think that they're going to be heard for their much speaking. There is no power in empty prayers said over and over and over and over and over. That's an act of the heathens. <clears throat> so that's not praying always. But to pray always does mean, it does mean to live in a constant awareness of God, of his presence being with you. Mm. <coughs> you know, there's a verse of scripture that sticks in my mind a lot of times <clears throat> it's actually from psalm chapter 10 verse number four talking about the wicked and what it says is that god is not in all their thoughts that's that's how the bible describes and defines the wicked people is that god is not in all their thoughts which which means then <clears throat> to not be wicked <clears throat> to be a believer means God is in all of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that 24 hours a day you're thinking about God, but he's always right there. I mean, <clears throat> when I got saved in December of <clears throat> 1978, <clears throat> when I prayed that prayer asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins and come in my heart and be my Lord and Savior, that started a conversation uh, 43 years ago almost that has never stopped. That has never stopped. He, he did come into my heart. He saved my soul. And he has been with me all that time since then, never any further away than a breath. <clears throat> God is not in the thoughts of the wicked, but he is constantly <clears throat> in the thoughts of those who are saved. To pray always does mean that your soul has a constant outreach to your God, to God. <clears throat> it does mean... That, that everything, all the experiences of our life become a, a continuing prayer with God. That whatever's going on, 
we have that connection to talk to the Lord about it at all times. <clears throat> now, I understand that we don't always do it, <clears throat> but he's always right there, ready to hear from us, wanting to hear from us, whatever it is that we're experiencing. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's a lot of things in our life that, that remind us to pray or maybe uh, inspire us to pray. Uh, <clears throat> things that we face when, we are, when we're facing a temptation, <clears throat> the best thing to do is to call on God. You know, <clears throat> something I have found is uh, it's virtually impossible to sin and pray at the same time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it, it's virtually impossible to fail God while you're praying to him. <clears throat> and so by having that constant prayer contact, that's what puts the armor of God on us. It's how we use that armor. It's how we strap it on. It's by through that continuing prayer life. And when we see sin and wickedness around us, <clears throat> it inspires us to ask God to work in that situation, to bring uh, uh, his glory out of even the worst of situations. When we, when we, something, when we see something that is beautiful, that inspires us to give thanks to God and to pray to him you know <clears throat> that always that makes me think of rainbows <clears throat> um, when you see a rainbow it's, it's such a beautiful thing and uh, <clears throat> and sometimes you have the opportunity to see a double rainbow even and it's just such an amazing thing and for most people that have any spiritual connection with the rainbow they know they know that it's God's promise that he's never going to destroy the world in a flood of water again but that's not what I think about because years ago while I was uh, in prison God showed me uh, some verses in Isaiah 54 that totally changed what I think about when I see a rainbow <clears throat> Isaiah 54, verses 9 and 10. It's God making a promise to his people. He said, For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah <clears throat> should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, <clears throat> nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace, covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that has mercy on thee. So when I see a rainbow, to me, it's a reminder <clears throat> that God will never be angry with me. <clears throat> that the price has been paid, that what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient to pay for all of my sins, and that I received the righteousness of Christ when I received him as my Savior, and the war between God and I was forever, forever, forever over. And so when you see a rainbow, let it remind you that God used the rainbow <clears throat> a couple of thousand years later after Noah's flood to tell his people, this is a reminder that I will not be wroth with you. You will not face my wrath. <clears throat> I am the God who has mercy on you. That's what you should think of when you see a rainbow. When we go into a time of trouble, when we find ourselves walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it inspires us to pray for God's help, to pray for his deliverance when we find ourselves weeping in sorrow, when we find ourselves crying, it causes our heart to cry out to God for support, for, for help, for deliverance, <clears throat> for encouragement. And even when we find ourselves happy, <clears throat> feeling joyful over something that has occurred or something that we're considering, that too causes our hearts to lift up to God in thanksgiving for what he has done. When we meet a lost sinner, a, a, a friend, a family member, somebody, somebody that we come across, 
and we know and the evidence is there that they don't know Christ <clears throat> it encourages us to pray for them that Christ would work in their life to that end <clears throat> to bring them to himself <clears throat> when we when we live our life that way um, then our life becomes this constant communion with God like like waves of the sea crashing on the sea so our life becomes one wave of prayer after another throughout our days as various things uh, happen to us and as we're going through life and as we're thinking about things and faced with good things and bad things they become like waves of the sea bringing us back <clears throat> to our Heavenly Father in prayer <clears throat> calling on him in uh, dependence <clears throat> So that our soul is constantly breathing out its need for God and its love for our Father and its dependence on Him. All right. <clears throat> Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be finished for today. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, that we have this amazing privilege and opportunity called prayer. <clears throat> Father, that you have given it to us as a, as a way for our soul to be able to pour out its need, its desires, its um, desperation sometimes, Father, uh, to you and to know that you hear and desire to answer our prayers. And Lord, we confess that we oftentimes don't understand why the trouble we face is necessary in our life. And yet we know that you do all things well, that you love us supremely. So if you allow it into our life, it is, it is for ultimately a divine purpose of good <clears throat> so father we pray that you would help us lord to keep our souls open in prayer to you and father we ask these things in your holy precious name amen, amen.